Oh, well, I have to hit the record button first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this meeting is being recorded. Oh. That's ominous. <laughs> okay, everybody, welcome to the January 2023 FileMaker Pro User Group, Dallas, Texas. We're glad to have everybody as well as a bunch of people online. Sorry for our minor delays on... on uh, uh, getting things started with technical difficulties. So uh, Greg Price and I are the chapter co-coordinators co and uh, we're ready to kick off 2023 with a lot of exciting things. Uh, one of the things is we are looking for uh, presenters for 2023. So if you might have a topic that you either want to suggest or even better uh, want to give, uh, give, get with Greg or myself and we would love to hear about that and maybe work you in on the schedule. Uh, I haven't heard any rumors on uh, Claris Engage. Anybody else heard any rumors or anything? Well, that's the annual supposed developers conference that's been canceled for how many years in a row? Uh, but I'm crossing my fingers <laughs> that we'll consider COVID over with, or at least Apple will, and we'll be able to move forward. But who knows? Uh, we'll see what 2023 brings. Uh, as far as uh, any uh, FileMaker news out there, um, I know they're getting the studio uh, licenses out to people, but I don't know any big news. Steve, you heard any big news from Claire Spilemaker? Okay, well, anyway, uh, I guess things will uh, will be happen as we find out. Maybe Greg knows something, but uh, uh, anyway, we're going to focus on what we're going to learn today. Uh, today we have uh, Brian Ham, a longtime personal friend uh, who's multi-talented in so many ways from running to singing to all kinds of things he puts me to shame but not to ring uh, central but uh, <laughs> <laughs> other things other yes. things so but uh, he he's uh, got to teach us about Swift uh, we're glad to have him we'll do a little bit of learning here about it so uh, hopefully he'll teach us all about Swift and how we can maybe integrate or use that with uh, some of our FileMaker solutions and see what the possibilities are so Without further ado, Mr. Ham. All right. We're going to talk about uh, Swift and FileMaker um, uh, and basically how to use those two together instead of uh, feeling like being forced to either choose between FileMaker or Swift. So um, there's some interesting ways to use them together that we're going to talk about. But I'm going to drop you with a quote real quick to get started and let you read that for a second. And this is probably uh, a little uh, more appropriate than I intended. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'll leave it at that. Um, so you might not be a Flaming Lips fan, and that's okay. Uh, they're an acquired taste. Uh, but Wayne Coyne has a penchant for dropping bombs of wisdom on people, uh, helping them to get out of their own way. And it has a way of paying off. So go and see what happens. Uh, in college, that landed me at Jim Henderson's office auditioning for something, choir, uh, that I wasn't sure I'd necessarily be good at, uh, much less continue for 10 years uh, after college. Uh, at the end of my first season, I was in the choir loft at the Meyerson with a 100-voice choir and a full orchestra, uh, performing pieces like uh, Walton's Belshazzar's Feast, uh, the Durfle Requiem, and Carmina Burana. Uh, a few years later, uh, it landed me at Carnegie Hall and the Concert House in Vienna. Uh, it's also found me in some coveted photo pits, uh, shooting bands like St. Vincent, uh, Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth, uh, the Jesus and Mary Chain, uh, Spoon, and the Flaming Lips. Uh, in 2021, it put me at the starting line of the Dallas Half Marathon uh, for a race and a distance that I wasn't sure I was ready for. Uh, last month, I raced it again, beating my previous time by 12 minutes and finishing under two hours. Go me. Yeah. Um, and finally, uh, it's put me here this afternoon with you lovely people. And again, I feel slightly out of my depth. Uh, I have no history of presenting. Uh, it may turn out that I have no presentation game at all, uh, but it might not. And so in the spirit of Wayne Coyne, let's do this thing and see what happens. So as far as more formal introductions, uh, you already know uh, something about my previous life as a musician. Um, I've got 20 years of uh, FileMaker experience. Um, the first 10 of those uh, was spent in-house as a solo dev. Um, and the latter half 
uh, as a freelancer. Uh, I've got six years of Swift experience, which puts me basically right at the beginning of that timeline at, uh, from Apple's announcement in 2015 um, at WWDC. Uh, I've got two apps currently in the App Store uh, that are public anyway, uh, and one of those I'll be demoing, hopefully, <laughs> uh, for you today. Uh, I'm the creator of Swift FM, uh, which is a public framework. Uh, it's published uh, on GitHub. Uh, it is a free resource for the FileMaker community at large, and I was fortunate enough uh, in 2018, uh, 2019 rather, um, to have it featured by one of Apple's engineers uh, at DevCon APAC uh, in Sydney, Australia. Uh, they contacted me uh, over LinkedIn. Somebody saw it uh, from Apple. Uh, on GitHub and asked if they could do a special session on it uh, to end up the conference in 2019. So that was exciting. All right, uh, so what are we going to talk about today exactly? We're going to talk about, uh, in order to talk about uh, Swift FM, uh, we need to talk a little bit about the FileMaker history uh, in the mobile space, which we will do. There's three or four events in particular on that timeline uh, that will make more sense as to how I arrived at, at creating Swift FM. Uh, I'll, I'm going to show you a real-world uh, production uh, public FileMaker database uh, for the Art Conspiracy organization I was uh, part of uh, and the companion iOS app uh, that I wrote in Swift. Uh, I will show you some Swift code and some differences between something called UIKit and Swift UI, which are the two uh, sort of primary ways of, of building a, an iOS app. Uh, I will cover some gotchas, um, we'll talk about some third-party apps and some other resources that I found super helpful um, on my path to doing this. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and talk about history. Uh, the three major uh, points on this timeline are FileMaker Mobile, FileMaker Go, and the iOS app SDK. Uh, some of you may or may not know about FileMaker Mobile. This was a... Um, a software product released for Palm OS, uh, so Palm Pilots, uh, Handspring was another manufacturer, but these were basically devices that uh, predated the smartphone. They used a stylus uh, for, for entry. They had horrible handwriting uh, recognition and uh, monochromatic screens and the like. They didn't work over the internet, um, but for, the, for their time, they were, uh, they were pretty cool. Um, I was an in-house developer at this point and I set up FileMaker Mobile for a couple of our salespeople uh, who took their FileMaker uh, data out on sales trips. Uh, and they, they liked it a lot. It was, uh, again, this is, this is all relative uh, to the time, but uh, prior to smartphones, this was about the only way you could do it. Uh, the problem is that uh, a few years later, uh, Apple decides they're going to release the iPhone and they systematically murder three or four industries probably, all at the same time overnight, uh, including FileMaker Mobile and uh, Palm OS. Uh, the next stop on our timeline is FileMaker Go, which I'm sure all of you here are, are familiar with. Uh, at this point, uh, FileMaker is doing a great job uh, keeping up uh, with sort of the state of mobile development. Um, the App Store, uh, FileMaker Go came out right alongside the App Store pretty much, uh, and it was a much better way uh, than FileMaker Mobile of, uh, of using your FileMaker data on a mobile device. Uh, it was essentially a wrapper. You could move a uh, FileMaker solution file over to FileMaker Go and open it. Um, at this point, there are a couple, there's a small gap that's starting to form, though, uh, between FileMaker Go and, and, and native iOS apps. And they're not really readily apparent yet um, to just regular users, but what's happening is that the App Store has been out. Uh, Apple is providing uh, a number of their own apps. Uh, Third-party developers are making their own apps. And so what's happening is users are, are starting to hardwire their behavior and their expectations uh, as to what an iOS is supposed to behave like. You know, they're getting used to things like pull to refresh, uh, swipe actions on table views, um, and any number of other UI behaviors that are just sort of now expected and, and, and standard for iOS apps. Uh, the problem is that FileMaker Go is not really able to do this uh, in the same way, and so there's, there's a little bit of a, a features UI gap happening at this point that's just beginning. Uh, the other problem is that uh, with iOS 3, um, 
Apple has released something called Core Data, which is a way, it's a persistence layer for iOS apps. It's what lets apps work offline uh, primarily. And so what's going on is Core Data lets an app, the app data is separated from the user data. It's what lets you do things like install updates to apps from the App Store or you know, install a brand new copy of an app on a second device and, and have all your data show up. Um, FileMaker Go doesn't support this type of behavior either, and so there's this, this sort of features gap going on, and it's, it's sort of interfering with users' expectations of, of what it means to, to, to use an iOS app. The final stop, or next to the final stop, is the uh, FileMaker iOS app SDK. And this is, this hits my radar personally, this hits me immediately. Uh, this is right in my wheelhouse. Uh, it's, 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 I'm thinking it's, it's exactly what I was looking for. Um, so I jump in right away, um, start banging around, uh, writing a lot of code, and very quickly find out that there are some things that uh, that are just really kind of lacking as far as what I'm looking for personally, the kind of apps that I'm trying to build. And so what I found out is that there's a, a lot of uh, delegate behavior that's not available, that is available for uh, normally uh, in iOS uh, regular apps. Uh, there's no process to manage app data separate from user data. There's no version control. Um, um, Claris is, is not officially at this point supporting uh, deploying apps to the App Store with this SDK. And, and so this is slightly discouraging for me, again, personally, being that I've already got some Swift experience, I've already got an app in the App Store at this point. And so the iOS app SDK uh, turns out to be something that I was, I'm excited about initially, but quickly determined that it's, it's not gonna work for, for what I'm trying to do. So I go back to uh, focusing on Swift uh, at this point. And what I'm really looking for all this time is I'm just really wishing that someone would let me just talk to FileMaker Server directly. Just let me call it the way I call a weather service API or the Facebook SDK or uh, you know, any, basically any API that you would, uh, any other API that you might call over the internet. And so I'm just desperately wanting this to happen. Um, I'm, I'm putting it out in the universe. I'm burning incense. I'm chanting. <laughs> whatever it takes uh, to hopefully get uh, this thing I'm looking for. And finally, uh, have my prayers answered uh, with the FileMaker Data API. And this is a very big deal. Um, a lot of you are probably uh, familiar with it or have used it already, uh, or definitely aware of it at minimum. And so now, uh, what this is going to let me do is, uh, now I can just call FileMaker Server directly at, at, with an endpoint, just like any other, uh, any other web service. And I've already got an iOS app in production that's not using it at this point, but it would be a perfect fit for it. And so I go uh, and revisit my app and see if I can sort of retrofit this uh, data API behavior into it. Uh, this organization I'm speaking about is uh, Art Conspiracy. Uh, it was around for about 15 years until recently. Uh, it's a nonprofit arts organization uh, that I was part of for about eight years. And we held two primary events every year uh, that involved art auctions, bands. Um, all, all of the artwork would be auctioned off uh, in a single night. We'd raise $30,000, $50,000. Uh, at these events, and then we would pick a beneficiary that we felt was, was deserving of that. Sometimes it would be a, a, a school in West Dallas, an art school or music school that was in danger of, of closing or being priced out of the area. Um, sometimes it was to, to hire more teachers for, uh, uh, for an art department someplace, um, you know, or keep a, a theater open that was in danger of closing or, needed, or was trying to expand sometimes. These events, uh, happen uh, every November. Uh, over the 15 years, we ended up raising uh, about three quarters of a million dollars uh, for other nonprofits. So we're a nonprofit raising money for other ones. Uh, over those years, we had uh, close to a thousand artists, uh, 100 bands, and 700 volunteers uh, to pull this off. This is, these are attended by eight, nine hundred, a thousand uh, attendees. So the production level is, is, is such that it, it requires a small army uh, to pull off. And all the production for these events, uh, uh, printed labels, uh, QR codes, 
giant uh, projected images of, of artists uh, while their pieces are being auctioned. All these things are being uh, generated and produced in FileMaker. So we're already using FileMaker for a number of years at this point without an iOS app in, at all. And what I would like to show you is a real world uh, example of this. This is a production database uh, with some slightly stale data, but it's, it's out there in the cloud right now. And uh, I wanted to show you a real live version rather than screenshots of this. So this is, a, uh, this is my record in the FileMaker, in the ArtCon database uh, for volunteers. Uh, we've got all of the events. I've got it broken down and filtered by uh, the, the type of volunteer, um, all the sort of normal information. We can send as SMS messages uh, via Twilio uh, to any, any volunteer. I've got all the volunteers' history uh, as to what teams they're on and such. Um, we've also got an artist uh, section of the database where all of the pieces and, uh, that an artist has contributed to various events uh, are listed. Uh, these, these records are all um, part of an event, of course, and this, these actual FileMaker records are feeding the ArtCon uh, iOS app, like in real time. And so I can go in, for instance, if I went in to change, uh, I'm going to try to do this and we'll see if it works. If not, I'll just skip it. But if I go in here, I'm just going to add my middle name and commit that. And I'll uh, show you in just a moment um, how that works in the, uh, how that reflects, uh, how that change is reflected in the iOS app. But we've also got some other things going on here uh, as far as uh, events. Um, what I'm doing here is this is a call to the Facebook SDK to fetch uh, uh, Facebook events uh, that are also uh, included in the ArtCon iOS app. Uh, these are just simple insert from URL calls that a lot of you guys are familiar with. Uh, but this lets me uh, basically hoover, hoover up Facebook events into a record that I can then edit and, and uh, make changes to descriptions, um, you know, and just basically massage the data before it lands in the iOS app directly. So that's happening, and uh, as well as uh, bands. Uh, all of the bands uh, that have ever performed for an ArtCon event, all of the albums for those bands uh, that show up in the Apple Music Store, uh, are fetched via the Apple Music API, and they land in the ArtCon database, which then feeds the iOS app in the, uh, for the playlist section. And I'm going to try to switch over to the app on my phone. And that looks like that's working. That's good. So now I've got, in the, on the, the bottom row here, I've got the ArtCon app. And this is an app that's still in the store. It's... Um, you know, it's a live app. It's just the, the, the event data is a little stale. But I've left it out there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open the ArtCon app. <clears throat> this is, these are the, just the, the primary areas of the app. We've got the calendar events uh, that I showed you where I was fetching from the Facebook SDK. These events just get drawn in uh, and fetched into the app and persisted. These work offline. So if the user loses connectivity, um, they have no idea uh, uh, that they're not connected at that point. The app continues to run uh, with no interruption at all. Uh, we've got a section for uh, uh, the art auctions. Uh, users can favorite. They can swipe to favorite an artist to follow them. Um, you know, they can jump over to the other auction, uh, other auction blocks. Got a, a playlist. All of the bands that I showed you in the FileMaker solution, uh, those are all fetched in, in here as well. Um, they can be browsed, they can be played, uh, which will just randomly pick a track from the Apple Music Store, and it will play a track uh, for a given artist. Um, if I edit any of the band's information in the FileMaker uh, database, those changes will be reflected as soon as the uh, app is opened. Uh, there's also a playlist <coughs> of albums, which was also in the FileMaker solution. Um, the volunteers, uh, you may have just caught that my name just refreshed uh, as we entered the screen. That's, that was fetching the change I made by adding my middle name a moment ago. Um, 
all of the, uh, the volunteers' bios and, and associated uh, social, uh, social accounts show up. There's also a, a sign-up form, which is a, uh, uses iOS you know, native uh, UI uh, objects, you know, so they can go in and use segmented controllers. Uh, when they go to enter a text field, they get the, the proper um, yeah, keyboard uh, shifting so that the UI, none of the UI is blocked. I know that's been an issue with FileMaker Go apps uh, on occasion. Uh, but those, those uh, volunteer forms uh, get submitted and then they land directly in the FileMaker solution where they can be scrubbed and a uh, volunteer can be assigned to a team. Uh, when someone swipes on, a, on an artist in the app to favorite them, that puts them in their iCloud account. And so favorites don't belong to the app, they belong to the user. So what that means is that if this user uh, decides to upgrade their phone or they drop it in the lake, <laughs> uh, they have a second device, uh, whatever the uh, situation is, it, this, will, this data is an iCloud. It will survive a delete and a reinstall. It will survive a second device. Um, it will follow them anywhere they're logged in with their iCloud account. So you don't have to decide to have all your data in FileMaker or all of your data in iOS, you can, you can combine all these things and, and let users sort of get the best experience, really. They don't have to make compromises about it. So there's a support section. Uh, this is basically just wired up to Slack's API, uh, where if they're an artist, they can go in and uh, uh, basically just write a simple message. They have a feedback request, they have a bug, uh, uh, a bug report, they just want to say hello, you know. Uh, they fill out this form and submit it and it lands in our Slack channel for the organization. So again, this is, this is using a lot of different services in addition to the FileMaker Data API. So being able to combine all this, this functionality uh, can be pretty great. So I'm back in the, in the, uh, the FileMaker database uh, for our conspiracy, though, so anything, uh, that's inbound, such as a volunteer form submission, would land in this database, and then our, our uh, team members could, um, could use that, uh, those records to, to generate teams and shifts and, and whatnot. So there's this back and forth going on with, with live uh, FileMaker data at this point. Uh, so at this point, um, I, I've done an experiment um, for the art uh, conspiracy event that was being held that particular year. I used the data API in a real world event, uh, you know, in a, in a warehouse with, with very bad internet connectivity. Uh, did use it as a battle test for the data API. I wanted to see how it would stack up, you know, something like that. I've got hundreds of attendees at this event and I want to see if this thing really works. So we go through this event and it turns out it, it works great. <laughs> Uh, which is everything I was sort of hoping the iOS uh, app SDK uh, was going to be uh, when it came out. So I'm very happy at this point. We go through uh, two or three years of ArtCon events using the, d the, the data API. I'm, I've gathered up my, um, uh, my URL session calls in Swift and, and sort of packaged, started to package this up as a, a product that I can start sharing with other people. And I put it on GitHub. Uh, where I mentioned it gets, uh, gets the attention of an Apple engineer who then demos it on my behalf in Australia <laughs> at, the, uh, at the APAC DevCon. Um, the problem is that uh, in 2020, uh, COVID happens and it just lays waste basically to organizations like Art Conspiracy that, that, that just com completely depend on public events in crowded spaces. <laughs> So our events come to a halt. Uh, Apple at this time is released uh, iOS 15, which includes some uh, long awaited uh, features like async await and just other, other features that iOS developers have been kind of craving for, for, for a little while. And I've, since we, we've got no events going on for our conspiracy, I've got nothing but time you know, to, to basically take what I've written, this sort of minimum viable product of uh, the early version of Swift FM, and I'm able to, to, to flesh this thing out. I'm, it, instead of having a half-baked, no version control, uh, you know, GitHub file, uh, I basically take this time to, to 
add all of the feature parity for the FileMaker Data API, uh, all the things that I wasn't using in the Art Conspiracy app. Uh, I wasn't calling scripts, I wasn't dealing with containers, I wasn't fetching layout metadata. So there were a lot of things in my, uh, in my battle test uh, with the Data API that I, that I wasn't using, didn't need to use. So I take this, this lull uh, in events uh, to go ahead and, and bring it completely up to speed. I'm, instead of be, it being half-baked, I'm going to fully bake the Swift FM uh, framework. So I go ahead and I do that, and I publish this out to GitHub, except now, instead of it being a flat file, now it's a real thing. It's, it's polished. It's, it's something I'm proud of. Um, it, it, gets, it starts getting a lot of attention uh, on GitHub, uh, picking up star counts. Um, and, and now it's sort of a fully formed, it's a fully realized version of what I started to build uh, back in 2016. And so what I'd like to do now is uh, show you uh, another demo of, of Xcode. We're going to go into Xcode, and I'm going to show you a real small example of, of what the Swift FM calls actually look like. But right before we do that, uh, I need to stop you for a second because you're going to see a couple of things, <laughs> handful of things that are going to, you know, are going to furrow your brow a little bit. Um, if you've done any kind of development in another platform, which most of you have, uh, you're going to see some stuff that you do recognize, vars, classes, structs, um, collections like arrays. Um, you're going to see some things that are going to be absolutely confusing, and you're going to see some other things that you think you know what they are based on your past experience, but you're going to realize that they don't really work the same way in some cases. So I'm going to jump over to Xcode. All right, so this is, a, this is Xcode. We're looking at a sort of minimum, this is about as small an example as I could write that's actually a working app. We're, first, we're importing UIKit, the framework, which just lets us tap into all the behavior. Uh, this next line is, um, these are what they call delicate protocols. Uh, and that's how UIKit works. UIKit is what the original iOS apps were, were built in. It's still very, very popular. There's far more UIKit-based uh, apps in the App Store than there are Swift UI apps. So it's important to look at and understand. Um, but the way UIKit works is you have a storyboard, uh, which is a lot like uh, layout mode in FileMaker, in that you're dragging UI elements onto a canvas. You're, you're um, you're, you're dragging from those UI objects into your code base to wire everything up, get it to work. The problem is, in, uh, if, if that's where you stop, the app is aware that a piece of UI belongs to a piece of code, but it doesn't know what to do about it when the state changes. It doesn't know what it's supposed to do when the UI needs to adapt to a change. And so the way you handle that in UIKit-based apps is you, you have to write a lot of delegate calls. Um, basically, you have to tell something like a table view, this is what you're supposed to do when a user swipes left. This is what you're supposed to do when a user pulls to refresh. This is what you're supposed to do when the backing store changes and you're supposed to shuffle items around from one section of a table to another section. And so without these delegate calls, the app is just basically dumb. It doesn't know what it's supposed to do. And so this requires a lot of boilerplate code uh, that's not difficult to write, especially once you get used to what the delegate uh, calls are, are named. Um, it's sort of trivial to do, but it's, it, it's just time consuming. And you have to write a lot of boilerplate that is no longer required uh, for newer apps. Uh, but basically, uh, beyond that, we've got a simp real simple model of an artist. Um, and we've got, um, we've got an array that we're going we're gonna to fetch. We're going to do a simple uh, fetch. And we're going to get some artist objects, put them in the array, and then we're going to tell uh, the table view to go ahead and, and uh, go ahead and draw those on the screen. I'm going to try to run this in a simulator, and I'll show you. And this is fetching from the Art Conspiracy database, the same one that's out in the cloud right now. There we go. So this is launching in the simulator, and these, are, these calls are actually going out over the internet right now. And I just fetched however many artists that is. I think I fetched 20. Yeah, down, down in the uh, lower right here, down the console. 
as part of the call, you can see the, the total count, the found count, and the return count for the, uh, for the request. So these are records uh, right from the, the Archon database right now that's out in the cloud. A um, couple things to point out uh, for UIKit apps is um, everything that you call, I've written it to, uh, to be kind of chatty, so it's going to echo some things out to the console to, uh, to, to, to sort of help you along, basically, because when you're, you're, when you're using this for the, for the first time, you're going to not necessarily be sure what's happening and what's not happening. So you've got some, some errors here. When the app first launches, it's got an invalid token, right? And so the next line is the result of fetching a new token. And then, you know, I'm just echoing out some behavior here, uh, some metadata that's coming back for the, uh, for the request. And so the thing that you want to take away from, from UIKit-based apps is that they require a storyboard. They require a lot of delegate boilerplate, a lot, really. Uh, this, this example <laughs> has almost none of it, but any kind of a, a mature app is going to have hundreds of lines of delegation that you're going to have to write and, and sort of keep up with. Um, the, the primary problem, it's kind of a silent problem uh, that UIKit has, is because the UI doesn't know how to sort of uh, change itself uh, as needed as the user is using the app, all of the UI elements have to be, as soon as they load on the screen, they're held in memory. Okay, so every UI element that might need to do something, alter its behavior, appearance, uh, anything like that, is going to have to stay in memory. And some other object is going to have to uh, just vomit out <laughs> notifications at a ridiculous rate to, to everything in, in, in the app in case a UI object uh, needs to be listening to that. And so it's really inefficient um, a way of doing things. It, it's just, it's chatty. The, the, the processors in the, in the iPhones are fast enough to sort of negate this for the end user, but the, it's, it's just really not a good way of doing things. You're, you're, having to, you're, you're having to babysit the app. You're having to babysit the UI constantly to make sure that it's always up to date and that you're not showing stale data. And so that's the, 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 big, the biggest problem with the UIKit app um, as far as which, which sort of app to pick, whether it's UIKit or SwiftUI. I'm going to show you a, a SwiftUI version of this same app. And just so I can point out the differences, we're not going to cover the whole thing, but I just want to show you how um, how it differs, um, instead of importing UIKit, we're importing the SwiftUI framework. We're still having to model uh, our, our data that's going to come back from the request. But what you'll notice down here, maybe, um, is that instead of writing a UI table view and having to write a bunch of delegate calls to, to keep the table view up to date, what you write in SwiftUI is you don't use storyboards at all. In fact, uh, SwiftUI dispenses with storyboards entirely. What you do in SwiftUI is you describe your UI uh, in views. And so you can do all this in code. And so what you do is you describe the, basically the, how the view is supposed to, to appear. And if any objects need to be connected, uh, let me put that up here. Oh, yeah, it's right there. Um, so we've got this body view. Every, every, every view in an app has one of these. But what we're doing here is we, when, the, when the app launches this view, it's going to jump down to this task. It's an asynchronous task. And so we're kind of working from the, from the inside out. This task, there's going to be nothing in the table view. When it launches, the task is going to fire. We're going to check the token until we get a good one. And then we're going to query uh, our artist table. And what that's going to do is it's going to populate this artist array, which is marked, if you notice, with this at sign. Um, this is what they call a property wrapper in SwiftUI. And it's a way of marking a, a source of data of some sort. It's, it's a way of marking an element in your, or an object, rather, in your app that's going to mutate its state. It's going to change, potentially change. And so what we're doing here is when this, the, the app launches first, it fetches our artist records, populates this, uh, this variable. And because we've marked, we've included, rather, that, that array in this uh, list view, 
what's going to happen is the list view is going to be called again. I didn't have to write any delegate calls to make this happen. This is the difference with, Swift, with the Swift UI app, is any view that contains a property wrapped object, typically a data store of some kind or a collection, uh, anytime that, that collection uh, changes its contents, it's going to tell any view depending on it to redraw itself. So this is great because we don't have to write delegate calls anymore, but it's also great from a resource standpoint in that when you run a, a Swift UI app, the instant a view has been drawn on the screen and all those pixels are on the screen and the viewer is looking at it, that view is destroyed. It's, it's, it's no longer, it doesn't exist anymore in the, uh, in the memory stack. It's, it only exists on the screen of that, of that device. And so the next time uh, the app needs to redraw that view because we have a new, uh, new array of artists, that view is redrawn, the pixels go to the screen, the user sees it, and again, that view is, is just completely annihilated. It doesn't exist anymore. And so this is a, a very efficient, uh, from a memory standpoint, and a, uh, you know, uh, a user experience standpoint. Uh, and it just involves hundreds of lines of delegation that you no longer have to write, which is great. And it works exactly the same way as the other one. We're gonna fetch, it's, it's the same network request. We're, st we're still fetching our, our artist records uh, from the database that's currently being hosted online. And so those are the primary differences um, between UIKit and SwiftUI. Primarily it's storyboards or no storyboards, delegation or no delegation, and storing everything about your UI in memory in case it's got to act on it versus not having to write any of that. All your views uh, are just written as needed and immediately destroyed. Uh, now we're going to um, we're going to do a, yes. So, this, so basically, the states are kind of like web hooks that only just call it when the when things change, and it does it automatically instead of you having to call and say right. check and see has it changed. The UI uh, for a Swift UI app is d driven entirely on state. Uh, if there's no state that's changing, if your app is just static, um, for the most part, then it's. It, it doesn't need to do much of anything, frankly. It's the, it, it, where it really shines is if you have some sort of an object that is going to change state. Uh, you, you might change the state of a, of a, of a simple switch, an on-off binary switch. You might uh, be fetching new artists or new event records, new album records. So anytime that, um, that property-wrapped uh, object uh, changes its state, it's going to call only the objects that know about it and those views will be redrawn. It's not going to be screaming constantly to all of the, all of the UI throughout your app in case it needs to be listening. So it's, it's just a much more efficient way of, it's just responding sort of from the, from the other side of that equation. Instead of having to manage the state yourself and constantly double check to make sure it's up to date, you just mutate the state and Swift UI will make sure it's always, it's 100% accurate all the time. No. So no more babysitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so as far as the differences, um, that's, that's it for uh, UI Kit and Swift UI. We're gonna spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about um, some tips and tricks, things I found immensely helpful uh, as I was learning how to write Swift apps. And uh, I'm gonna point out a couple things uh, that might be confusing. Um, that you won't have to struggle with if you decide to, to uh, write Swift apps on your own. Uh, the first of these being uh, the decision, the question isn't Swift versus Swift UI. Uh, a Swift UI app is just a way of describing your, your UI state, your, your views. You're still going to write a lot of Swift code in a Swift UI app. All your network calls are going to be written in Swift. Um, all of uh, just anything that's not UI related, you're still going to be writing uh, lots of Swift. The Swift UI is just going to be handling the views and it'll be handling the UI uh, on your behalf. Um, so the question, uh, it's also rather uh, not Swift versus FileMaker. As we've seen, we've got a, a production database out in the cloud right now on a FileMaker host, uh, and we're fetching. Um, 
you know, live FileMaker uh, record data and, and bringing it into Swift. So we're not having to decide. It's not a binary question. Uh, we don't have to, uh, you know, settle for something like FileMaker Go or an iOS app SDK-based app where you're kind of giving up fe features and, and some UI behavior and some niceties that your users are going to expect. Um, you don't have to decide uh, what you're going to give up. You don't have to give up anything. Um, you can write, uh, you can keep all of your internal workflows and back-end processes in FileMaker, your, uh, your layouts that you can quickly throw together uh, as you can in layout mode, um, in your back-end teams that are managing all that data. You can keep all of that. And uh, what you'll be using, though, is instead of having to um, forego various functionality, you can use uh, iOS uh, natively to just completely bridge that gap and give your users all of the behavior that they've come to expect from all of their other apps. Uh, another thing to point out is dates, which are, again, if you've done any kind of development in any platform, frankly, dates are a pain <laughs> uh, to keep straight. A lot of different formats involved. Some use UTC, some use strings uh, to represent this. And we all know FileMaker uh, as an epoch of uh, uh, the year 001. Um, if you fetch a date uh, with the FileMaker data API, what you're going to get back is a date as a string. And that's, that's OK. Um, but what would really be a lot easier as far as writing queries and trying to sync your data, you know, if you're going to do something like that, what, you want to, what you're interested in is fetch me all the records that have changed since I was last in the app. The last time I closed the app, a stamp was set somewhere. Give me all the records, only give me the records that have been changed or added since I left the app. And you can't really do that with a string. Um, but if you write a calculation in FileMaker shadowing your modified date timestamps, and you turn that timestamp into an int or a number in FileMaker's case, now you've got a simple numeric value and that makes it a lot easier to compare. Uh, you can, it makes for writing very, very easy, uh, quick uh, and accurate queries uh, to sync and fetch only the data you're interested in. For anything else, uh, for a, a string, uh, you know, sort of a string date, uh, the way they come back in the data API, uh, if you need to use those, you can. Uh, there's something in Swift called date formatter, which is very, very powerful. You can take a, a date string of any imaginable format, and date formatter knows how to look at those and parse those and turn them into actual uh, either ints or turn them into a, another date string with a different format or a naming convention. Uh, over on the Swift side, or the Xcode side, um, the epic date for, uh, for Swift is 2001, which uh, is going to make for some really interesting queries unless you convert, again, your dates into, uh, into a, a numeric value like an int. If you just call date, and you're not, you're not interested in doing comparisons or doing math between, say, two different dates, uh, you can just call date by itself. The date uh, object will give you back you know, the current date and time, just like a, a, a get date will in FileMaker. But again, it's, it's all about queries. You don't want to fetch everything. You want to fetch the stuff that's changed since you were in the app last. And so to do that, you just wrap the date, um, the date object in an int, and you call the time inter interval since 1970, which is a, uh, a method on date in Swift that will give you back exactly that number. And again, it just it makes for much easier queries, uh, lets you uh, do accurate syncs with, with, uh, with the correct data. Um, we can talk about mod IDs for a second. Um, the FileMaker Data API will return your field data, of course, uh, but sort of adjacent to that, it's going to also return a record ID value and a mod ID value. These two values do not belong to your field data. They are an object, one object uh, outside of your field data. But they're returned nonetheless. And if you are working with mobile devices, mobile users uh, that are syncing, they need to work offline. Maybe they're going to lose internet connectivity for a bit, and they're going to come back at some point and be online. Uh, what you don't want to happen is a user be out in the field uh, for, say, an hour on a sales call or something, 
And then somebody back at the office, you know, meanwhile, has changed 15 records. Maybe deleted some records, uh, added some new records, changed some other ones. And then the user get back, gets back online with their mobile device out in the field, and they're going to need to know that those, that those records are not in their current version. The, the mod ID is going to be incremented at that point, and they're, gonna, they're not going to know about that. And so when you write a query, uh, you can include this mod ID value. So what, in practice, what you do is when you call a fetch for, say, artist records, uh, I'm going to get back artist records, my field data, of course. Uh, I'm also going to get mod ID values for all of those artist records. And if I'm smart, what I'll do is I will save that mod ID value as part of the artist record object uh, in Swift. And then when I call my fetch, I'll include that mod ID value. And what happens is if you pass the mod ID in your query, it will check to make sure that the records that, that are going to be returned from your query are, at, are the current version of that. And if those mod IDs do not match your query, that record will not be fetched, or not be edited, rather. Um, if you do not include a mod ID value in your query, uh, FileMaker is going to assume that you know what you're doing, and it's going to just execute that edit uh, on a record, and that's probably not what you want. It's, it's, it's a good idea to, to include these mod ID values uh, if you're going to have people out in the field that are possibly going to have their records be out of date uh, by the time they return. So it, if you include it, it will, the server will check that on your behalf and make sure you don't make a big mess. <laughs> uh, core data, uh, which you may or may not use, this is, this is the persistence layer for all iOS, well, almost all iOS apps uh, will opt into something called core data. Uh, this is a way of making sure your apps can run uh, when they're offline. Uh, most good apps uh, will use it. Um, what the mistake a lot of people make if they've heard about core data or they talk to somebody about it is, is they, they equate it with the database. Core data is not a database. Uh, that was really confusing for me at the beginning. Core data is a framework. The actual store, or what you would call a database, is, is generally a SQLite store. It can be XML, there's a couple other formats, but 95% of the time it's going to be a SQLite store. Um, and you think, oh great, I know a little bit about SQLite, I know how to query SQLite. That's great, you don't get to talk to the store <laughs> in core data. And that's a good thing. Uh, what you do is you call, you call a context object. And a context object is sort of like your scratch pad. It's your work area for your queries and your uh, you know, changing records, deleting records. You do all those behaviors or all those actions are performed in a context. Uh, that context is going to update then, and the context is going to talk to something called a coordinator, and the coordinator is going to say, hey, my, uh, my end user just changed the context, and it's going to go ahead, and it's going to generate the SQL uh, queries and the actions, and the, those calls are going to be done for you. You are not going to write those calls. Um, and so what I wanted to sh share with you on this is that if you do get into iOS app development, you're probably going to want to persist the data for your users because they're going to expect it now, because most apps do this. Um, but when you first enter into this sort of core data world, you're going to, this is going to be confusing for a lot of you, and so you need to understand it's not a database, it is a framework, and that you will not be writing SQL queries. It's actually quite easy, though. You, the, 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 the functions that you make uh, in code are, are actually going to be the same no matter what the backing store is. So if you've actually got an XML store, um, your queries to the context are going to be exactly the same. So they're basically just abstracting all this, this the actual store away from, uh, from the developer and making it consistent across any, any, any kind of backing store. Uh, as far as, uh, these aren't all the types by any means, uh, we've talked about the first, uh, the first four of these. These are the, basically the equivalents uh, of FileMaker uh, types versus uh, Swift types. Uh, the one that's new, <coughs> excuse me, the one that's new on this list is a bool, and we all know that, that uh, FileMaker doesn't have a bool type, um, and everybody kind of gets around this generally by using ones and zeros, uh, which is fine. Sometimes people use uh, yeses and nos, or they'll just type true or false as a string and just sort of kind of handle it you know, later. Um, what you do in Swift 
is actually Swift actually has a bool type, like a lot of languages, a lot of platforms uh, have a specific bool type. Uh, the way you get around this uh, in FileMaker is if you're going to fetch um, a record and you're and you're say you're storing ones and zeros for your uh, for some kind of uh, is completed field or something uh, in FileMaker, and so this one or this zero is going to come back uh, in the data API probably as, a, as an int, if you've stored it as a number in FileMaker, or if you've typed in words like yes or true or false, it might come back as a string <clears throat> in the data API. So you can handle that either way. Uh, NS number and NS string uh, have a, a method called bool value, and it's, these are actually, these values are actually, uh, these methods rather, are actually quite smart. Uh, if you receive a one or a zero back uh, in the data API, you can use you can call bool value, but up at the top of this uh, slide, uh, you've got a bool value method, and it knows what ones and anything that's a zero is going to be false. Anything that's not a zero, a one, a five, uh, it's anything that's not zero will be true. Uh, if you're mapping this to a string file in Swift, this one's even smarter. Um, you can pass almost anything really to <laughs> an string. You can pass a yes. As a string, you can pass, yes, uppercase. You can pass it lowercase. You can pass a one as a string. As, you can pass the word true as a string. You can pass true uppercase or lowercase. And all of those are going to be recognized and will evaluate as true. Same thing goes for the, uh, you know, the inverse of that. One, uh, zero rather, as an int, zero as a string. The word false, uh, the word no. All of those will be uh, evaluated by a string bool value. Uh, the way you would expect. So that's the one you are, you're, you're generally going to want to use uh, when, you're, when you're working with bools coming out of FileMaker. Um, if you need to use an int in Swift, Swift uh, ints do not have a bool value uh, method uh, baked into them, but you can extend the int uh, class uh, with a, a very simple uh, uh, return, basically a, a check, and that will let you call a bool value uh, on an int and get the behavior you're looking for. But generally, you want to avoid that. Extensions are fine, but the easiest way is really just to use NS number or NS string because they're, they're going to they're gonna do more work on your behalf. And you can work with any number of, of bool sort of types coming out of FileMaker. They'll be, it's the most flexible. Um, there's also, a, in Swift, there's an actual bool object that you can pass a string into. Um, this works, but you should probably not use it <laughs> uh, because it's going to get you in trouble at some point. If you, pass, if you happen to pass the word true as a string and it's lowercase, uh, you'll be fine. If you pass false lowercase as a string, you'll be fine. If you pass true uppercase, that's not going to evaluate at all. And what's going to happen is uh, the bool is going to return a nil value. And that's not what you're going to want. <laughs> You're going, to need to be a, you're going to need to be able to evaluate uh, something that's true or false. And typically, bools will default to something like false. And so they're never in an unknown state. So even though the bool object or class uh, exists in Swift, you really want to stay away from it. I want to mention it in case you come across it in some kind of a Google search. Um, very dangerous. Just stay away from it. <laughs> Um, session tokens from the data API, y'all are aware of these. Um, you're aware that they last 15 minutes, um, and you are told that they will be um, extinguished in 15 minutes from their last use, and a lot of times that's correct, and sometimes it isn't, and you don't want to have to worry about those, uh, those conditions. Uh, what you really want to do is clean up after yourself <clears throat> and destroy those tokens, but you don't need to get carried away with it. You don't, there's no need to destroy tokens after every network call. You know, that's, that's, that's a bit much. Um, but what you can do is in, in a UI kit app, there's a delegate call called um, uh, will enter background that handles, as you would expect, handles background calls and behavior. So you would just destroy your tokens in will enter background. So the user swipes up, kills your app, and, and you want to you wanna delete your session token at that point, clean up after yourself. Don't expect the data API, or FileMaker server rather, to extinguish your session tokens. Um, some people get around this with proxies. 
that's fine. You can do that if you want. Um, if you want to keep things uh, uh, more direct and simple, uh, just kill your tokens in the, um, in the appropriate uh, uh, background delegate call. Um, in Xcode, when you're doing network calls, what you're going to run into something called ATS. Um, and so when you make a URL session call to any data, a, any data API, whether it's FileMakers or, or anyone else's, um, some of those, sometimes those URLs are going to be just regular HTTP URLs. They're not going to be, in, they're not going to be encrypted. Uh, you're going to need to fetch something from a website. You're going to need to fetch something from a, a, an API that just either doesn't support it or they're too lazy to implement it. And if you just drop an HTTP URL into your uh, network call, it's not going to do anything. Uh, because Apple has clamped down on, on just basically insecure uh, network transmissions. And so if you have an HTTP URL that you just have to use and you can't get your provider to, to opt into HTTPS, uh, you can include that in, uh, in Xcode in something called the uh, info.plist. You're, you're basically making an exception. You're saying, I know what I'm doing. Uh, I know this URL is insecure. I'm fine with it. Let me do it, please. But you have to tell it. Otherwise, you're going to be sh completely shut down uh, by Xcode. Uh, record field data uh, that you get back from the, the FileMaker data API over on the right of the slide uh, is sort of a, a, a little uh, a snippet of, of what that looks like. Uh, I mentioned the record ID and mod ID are returned uh, uh, with network calls to the data API. And you'll notice again, they're outside of your field data. They don't belong to your record data. They don't belong to your entity. Um, so when you need to do things like check a mod ID for something like a record update, you need to check uh, not field data where you might expect it to be. You might have your own uh, uh, timestamp fields and that's fine, you can call them from there. But if you wanna call the, what, what FileMaker is using, what FileMaker server is using, you need to look out right outside your field data uh, object and get them from there. Um, naming conventions for FileMaker fields uh, can be really interesting <laughs> um, with the various underscores, double underscores, triple underscores, G underscore, uh, you know, you name it. Um, spaces and field names, which you all should not be doing. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, they're out there and you're going you're gonna to make a data API call and whether it's to your server or maybe to somebody else's and you're going to have to deal with stuff like that. And what you want to do is there's something called coding keys uh, that's part of Swift, the, newer versions, the newest versions of Swift. And that lets you map uh, Swift properties uh, for your objects to your FileMaker field names. So instead of double or triple underscore, uh, you know, PK underscore ID, you can just have a field or a property uh, in Swift called ID. <laughs> um, and you can use coding keys to basically map those values, uh, make them much, much easier to work with. Um, so that, those are a few gotchas that, that you're going you're gonna to run into and you're going to stumble and it's going to slow you down. So hopefully that will uh, help speed you along at that point. I'm going to breeze through this because we're running out of time. Um, these are just resources. Uh, web, websites and, and, uh, and some apps that are invaluable uh, for, for working with the data API. Uh, they were invaluable to me when I was writing Swift FM, uh, the actual framework. And, and so I want to give you the benefit of, of my six years of stumbling <laughs> through the early days of Swift. Uh, the first resource is the one we're talking about. Uh, Swift FM is on GitHub. Um, that's where you can find it. Uh, it's uh, not been updated really. It's it's in a pretty uh, pretty uh, you know fully baked state at this point. Uh, every now and then I'll add some behavior to it. One of the things that's coming up is, is OData support, which is uh, the newer one of the newer APIs from Claris. Uh, it doesn't support it currently, but it will uh, certainly by mid year. Um, but uh, you can reach me on GitHub and and look at all of the example. Uh, code blocks. Uh, there's a lot of documentation there. I went kind of out of my way to explain uh, how all of it is constructed. Um, you can go to WWDC, uh, the website uh, for the Apple co conference. Um, there's a lot of, there's dozens and dozens of, of Swift sessions or Swish and, uh, sessions on Core Data, sessions on Swift, Swish, uh, sessions on 
network calls, best practices, um, very high level of production, even though they were doing their uh, conference remotely. So uh, highly recommended to check that out. There's everything you could possibly uh, want to know about is there. Um, there's also the official swift.org website uh, that has the, it's a reference basically. Um, so rather than sitting through hours of, of DevCon videos from WWDC, um, you, can, you can get through the Swift book um, rather quickly if you've got any kind of developer experience at all. Uh, covers all of the differences um, you know, with variables, how to handle collections, and, and things like that. That's the site looks like. Um, there's also a forum, a discourse-based uh, forum uh, that's uh, used by Apple. Uh, Apple engineers use it, and lots of uh, Swift developers use it. It's, it's open to the public. Uh, a lot of the features that end up in iOS, you know, that and that will end up in iOS in, in future builds, uh, some of that comes from uh, end users, end, you know, end users and developers that uh, do a good job of making their case on this forum for this behavior needs to change. These parameters should really be named in a different way. Here's a, uh, this function. Um, uh, the structure of it should be different. Whatever their idea is, they make a good enough case on this forum, Apple's going to pick up on it and they're going to open a radar. And if, if your idea is good enough and it's documented well enough, your feature request may very well show up in iOS 17. That's the forum. Uh, Discourse also has a, uh, there's an iOS app called Fig, F-I-G. Uh, it's available in the App Store for iPad and iOS. And uh, you can browse this web version of, uh, of the forum uh, in an app, which is kind of nice. There's a Slack community called iOS Developers. It is worldwide. It has 35,000 uh, members. Uh, it's not a typo. There are dozens and dozens of channels in this Slack. It is very, very active. Uh, and there is every level of developer you can imagine. And there are people that are brand new. There are people like me who are somewhere in the middle. Uh, maybe not Apple engineer Swift level uh, developer, um, but you've got uh, all skill types there. Everybody there is very friendly, very helpful. I learned a ton of stuff just by hanging out in this community and asking questions. Um, I mentioned earlier that, that, that the field data object that comes back in the FileMaker data API uh, is going to come back. Um, it, it's going to expect you to know you're going to have to model your data, basically. SwiftFM is going to handle the result, the response, the messages object, the data info object that's got all your, your query metadata. Everything that's included in all of the data API responses is going to be handled. SwiftFM is going to take care of all that for you. I can model all that. Uh, what I can't model is your entities. I have no idea on Earth what you're going to be querying. Uh, you know, how complex those entities are going to be. I don't know what your field names are going to be. And so, because of that, that's the one piece you're going to have to provide uh, when you make a Swift app. And that means you're going to have to write a class, which is not a big deal. I mean, you write classes in, in, in every other platform you've developed in. Um, but it can be a hassle, partly because of the field naming conventions, again, um, that FileMaker uses. And so, uh, to make all that easier and to save you from typos and, and things and when you're trying to map FileMaker fields to uh, uh, Swift properties, uh, what you can do is you can, if you have a working result that comes back in, in an API tool like PAW or Postman, you can just copy and paste that result into the QuickType website and it will immediately spit out all of your, um, all of your structs and all of your coding keys and all of your uh, URL calls, everything. Uh, it's, it's, it's like magic. Uh, there's probably other apps that do this. This is the one I used, and it, it saves me a ton of time. I still use it uh, all the time when I'm, when I'm building iOS apps. Uh, I use PAW. Uh, Postman is fine, I guess. <laughs> um, PAW is not an Electron app. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Don't hate me. Um, I know a lot of, there's a lot of fans of Postman. Uh, if, you, if you do use Postman, you should check out Paul, though. It's a native uh, Mac OS app. Um, does the same thing that Postman does. I just think it does a better job of it, personally. Um, that's what that website looks like. Um, when you make apps in iOS, or I should say, when you make apps in FileMaker, uh, the SF, SF, SVG, 
uh, icons uh, can be difficult to work with and manage uh, and to import things into. Uh, when you make iOS apps uh, in Xcode, uh, Apple has provided graciously something called SF Symbols, which is a 4,000, I think it's 4,400 icons in a library, and they're not just icons. They are every conceivable size, baseline alignment, color options, um, color options that can inherit your coloring and your theming in your app. Um, they're, they're editable, uh, they're, they're searchable. It's, it's, it's an actual app. It's a dedicated app that you can download. It's, it's, it's available right now. It's not just for developers. Um, you don't have to be an Apple developer in order to download this. So it, it's, it's very well organized, very well done. You can uh, browse through that. Uh, when you're writing an app and building it and need to call these icons and put them in your app, uh, once you get familiar with how they're named, uh, you can just call these uh, SF symbols directly in code. You don't need to use the SF symbols app and drag things from the app into Xcode or any of that nonsense. Once you get familiar with it, you can just literally write code and call call the symbol by name. And like I said, the alignment, the, the weight, whether they're sort of bold or, or, or lighter weight versions visually, um, all that stuff's in there. So it's, it's, it's nice uh, you know, versus S, SVG uh, type icons. Um, the, the last site um, that I'm going to talk about is uh, Objective-C.io. This is founded by um, a group of guys that, some of them used to work at Apple. Uh, these are the guys that were on the core data team. They wrote core data. They wrote different frameworks in Swift, uh, and they have since gone on to, to found Objective-C.io. And so if you want the deepest dive possible for Swift or how to persist data with core data, um, you can get a lot from, from other websites, but this is, this is about as authoritative as it gets. It's, it's as deep as it gets. Uh, if you want to get really into the weeds uh, on how everything works, exactly how everything works, and you can't get an Apple engineer on the phone, um, these guys are the next best thing. In some cases, they are past Apple engineers. And so those are some um, resources uh, that should be helpful to you, hopefully. <clears throat> Uh, normally, uh, as of a month ago or two months ago, uh, this would have been where I offered, uh, <laughs> I would be upselling you at this point <laughs> um, on things like hour blocks and, and, uh, and video coaching. But I am a freshly minted uh, software engineer here at Harmonic Data now, and so I'm going to direct all of those queries uh, to this office. And so if you need something um, like what I've discussed and covered today, and you just don't have the time to build it or the budget to build it, uh, and you want us to do it for you, we will be happy to do it. We will be delighted to do it. And so you should call Steve or Matt or me or somebody here, and, um, and we'll get you going on that. And so with that, I know I'm out of time. Right. Hopefully, uh, if you had some questions that occurred uh, while I was speaking and you jotted those down, so as you don't forget them, uh, you can email them to me. You can reach me in Slack. You can reach me on LinkedIn. You can reach me through email. I'm on Twitter, I'm on GitHub. Uh, I will be more than happy to show uh, more detailed examples. Again, this is, none of this stuff is theoretical. These apps are all in the App Store. They're all production level stuff, so it's not, they won't be examples of things. They'll be real world versions of, uh, of apps and databases. So I'll be able to answer anything you could probably uh, ask about what we've spoken about today. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Taylor. Okay, hit the stop sharing. Okay, so uh, no big announcements. Uh, next month we will be back here. I think we're going to be learning about colors. Woohoo! <laughs> so uh, come back here and we'll get into the more of the artsy side of FileMaker. So on the opposite side of the brain that I'm usually on. So, well, you, you do both. <laughs> anyway, Taylor Sharp signing off and we look forward to seeing everybody next month. I, I have to say, Brian, you said this was your first time doing a presentation. I this was. Thank you. I think you did an excellent job. Yes, awesome. Appreciate awesome. It. I didn't understand most of it. But <laughs> <laughs> you did a really good job of presenting it. Yeah.